if you do what it is that you're called upon to do, which is to lift your eyes up above the mundane, daily, selfish, impulsive issues that might beset you and attempt to enter into a contractual relationship with that which you might hold in the highest regard, whatever that might be, to aim high and to make that important above all else in your life, that that fortifies you against the vicissitudes of existence like nothing else can. And I truly believe that that's the most practical advice that you could possibly receive. The way that you fortify your faith in life is to assume the best, something like that, and then to act courageously in relationship to that. And, and that's, that's tantamount to expressing your faith in the highest possible good. It's tantamount to expressing your faith in God. And it's not a matter of stating, well, I believe in the existence of a transcendent de deity, because in some sense, who cares, who cares what you believe? I mean, you might and all that, but, but that's not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue, it seems to me, is how you act. The issue is not what you believe as if it's a set of facts, but how you conduct yourself in the world. The purpose of thinking is to let your thoughts die instead of you. It's a brilliant notion, and so the idea is something like you can conjure up a representation of yourself, you can conjure up a variety of potential representations of yourself in the, in the future, you can lay out how those future representations of yourself are likely to prevail or fail, you can call the potential use in the future that will fail and then you can embody the ones that will succeed. You do that well simultaneously conjuring up a representation of your current state and determining for yourself because of your undue suffering which elements of your pathetic being need to be given up so that you can move forward into that future. And the goal, what is it that you're aiming at with that work and that sacrifice? That's the ultimate question. What is it that you're trying to do? Well, you're trying to improve the future. We believe that the future can be improved. We believe that it can be improved as a consequence of our sacrificial work. And so, once again, what are the limitations? What are the limits to that? What are the necessary limits to that? I would say we don't know. We conjured up this remarkable idea. The future exists. We can see it even though it's only potential. We can adjust our behavior in the present in order to maximize our probability of success in the future. How best to do that? Well, the idea is something like, don't hesitate to offer the ultimate sacrifice. If you want the future to turn out ultimately well, what is it that you could contract for, let's say, if you were willing to give up everything about you that's weak and unworthy. The proper sacrificial attitude produces a psychological state and then a social state that's a manifestation of that attitude that decreases the probability that the world will careen into hell and increases the probability that people will live high quality meaningful private lives in a society that's balanced and capable of supporting that. And none of that seems to me to be questionable, really. I also don't think it's anything that people don't actually know. You know, people have told me many times that when they listen to me talk, they're hearing things that they already knew but didn't know how to say it's something like that and this is one of those things that i think is exactly like that i mean i think it's at the very core of our moral knowledge and which is our behavioral knowledge and our perceptual knowledge i mean let's get this straight moral knowledge is no trivial matter it's knowledge about how it is that you orient yourself in the world there's no more profoundly necessary form of knowledge well it's predicated on on something that's exactly like this we know that we have to make sacrifices we know that we have to aim at what's good so then why isn't that we don't aim at what's best and make the sacrifices that are necessary in order to bring that into play? I think it seems to me that in some sense that's self-evident. The question is why we don't do it, but there's answers to that too. Life is hard and it hurts people. It's rife with limitation and some of it's arbitrary. 
And some of it's unjust and some of it's worse, some of it's malevolent, which is even worse. And it's not surprising that that combination of vicissitude can turn people against being. But I think even when that happens and even when people have the kind of history that if they revealed to you, you would say, well, it's no wonder you turned out that way. The people who turn out that way still know that it's wrong. They still know that however deep their own suffering, however arbitrary their own suffering, however much that's caused by the malevolence of others, as well as the tragedy of existence, that that does not in any way justify their turning away from the good. And I believe everyone knows that. I believe that they know it implicitly, even if they don't allow themselves to know it explicitly. And I believe that if they violate that idea, then they violate themselves and that they end up in Cain's position, which is the position of the man who's been given a punishment that is too great to bear. Now we're capable of making sacrifices in abstraction, right? To conceptualize a future that we want, to let go of the things that are stopping us from moving forward and to free ourselves from the chains of our original preconceptions. Pursue pleasure, follow your impulses, live for the moment, do what's expedient. A mountain is something you have to climb and you have to climb to the pinnacle of a mountain and the mountain is up, right? And the mountain stretches up to heaven and it's a long journey to specify the right place on the highest pinnacle. And, and that's symbolic because of course it's a pinnacle that you're always trying to reach, just like you're always trying to aim, you're always trying to climb upward, at, at least that's the theory, it depends to some degree, of course, on your definition of upward. You're supposed to, again, to act out the highest good of which you're capable. Now that'll transform your life to some degree into an archetypal adventure. There's no way around that, because as you attempt to climb a higher mountain, let's say, or to aim at a higher target or something like that, then the things around you will become increasingly dramatic and of import. That ha happens by necessity, obviously, because if you're aiming at something difficult and profound and you're really working at it, then your life is going to become perhaps increasingly difficult and profound. But that might be okay. You might, that might be exactly what you need as an antidote to the implicit limitations that face you as a human being. The good father is precisely someone who is willing to sacrifice his child to the ultimate good. You have a moral obligation as a parent to encourage your child to go out into the world, right? And to be whoever they can be. To be the best they can possibly be. And in doing that, you're encouraging them to pursue the good. You're sacrificing them to the good. You're not keeping them for yourself selfishly. You're telling them that they can go out and live their life and live it properly. You don't want for your son what it is that you want for him. You want for your son what would be best for him and for the world. And you let go in precise proportion to your desire to have that happen. When you have an infant, you do everything for the infant because the infant can do nothing for him or herself. But as the infant matures and is increasingly capable of doing things for him or herself, then you pull back, right? You pull back and every time the child develops the ability to do something, you allow them or encourage them to do it and you don't interfere. You know, so if your child is struggling getting dressed, well, obviously there's some times that you help them, but mostly you let them learn so that they can know how to do it in the future. That's better for you and it's certainly better for them. There's a rule if you're working with the elderly in an old age home and the rule is something like, don't do anything for any of the guests, let's say, that they can do for themselves because you compromise their independence. And so as a mother, you pull back and you pull back and you let your child hit him or herself against the world and you fail to protect them. But by failing to protect them, you encourage and ennoble them to the point where you're no longer necessary. Now, they may still want to see you and it would be wonderful if that was the case, but the point is, is that you're supposed to remove yourself from the equation by encouraging your child to be the best possible person that person can be. And you sacrifice your desires 
all of your desires to that, your personal desires, even your desires for your child in relationship to you. Because you want them to move forward into the world as a light, right? As a light on a hill. That's what you want if you have any sense. And so you don't get to keep your children at home because you need them.